So in this video, we're going to look at how to create the player object so that we can set up all the necessary components, get the model imported into our scene, and get the player object moving around the scene with the click of our mouse button. So the first thing we need to do before we drop our player into our scene is bake a nav mesh. And the nav mesh is going to allow our player and our AI to move around the scene in a smart way. That means if there's an obstacle in the path, the player or the AI will move around that obstacle. It will also find the shortest distance between where it's starting and where it's supposed to go. Unity will do this for us out of the box with our nav mesh. But we need to set up our scene to enable us to bake that nav mesh. So what we need to do is go to our terrain. And so if you're using my terrain, it may already be marked as static. You can see up here in the inspector, we've got the static option here, and mine's just checked. And if I hit the drop down, you can see that all of these different ways of being static are marked as true. The most important one here is a navigation static. This allows the nav mesh to say, hey, this object's not going to move. I can bake a nav mesh around it. Anything in your scene that you want the player or the AI to navigate around also needs to be marked as static. Now, when you first mark something as static, it'll give you the option to mark all the children static as well. So you can see here that my stones, my props, my buildings, my trees are marked as static. Now, my grass, I've got some grass in here is not fully static. I've chosen it to be static in every way except for navigation static. I don't want my players to walk around the grass. They can walk through the grass, that's just fine. These other static properties can help the computer optimize the scene, and we'll get to that in a later tutorial when we talk about occlusion culling and baking the occlusion map for the scene. So next, to bake the nav mesh, we're gonna go up to Window, we're gonna go down to AI and Navigation. That's gonna open up a new window, Mine's been docked over here with my inspector. And I can go to bake, and I get a bunch of different options. And this dictates how the nav mesh agents are gonna move around your scene. So we've got an agent radius, agent, and agent height. This tells the computer how big your agents are gonna be. If you wanna walk around an obstacle, you don't want part of your character dragging through the obstacle. So that's where the agent radius comes in. This tells Unity that roughly your character is about a meter in diameter or a meter across. And so this will provide a edge around the obstacles so that the characters and the nav mesh agents don't get too close to an obstacle. The agent height does the same thing if you can pass under something. For example, these houses that are in my scene are more than two meters high and the nav mesh agents can actually walk into the house. Whether you want that to happen or not, it's up to you. And the max slope, this is what it sounds like. This is the maximum slope that the nav mesh agents can walk up. I'll probably alter this so that my agents can't walk up the walls of my terrain here. I wanna keep my AI units inside the game field. The step height, this is the biggest step up that the players can take. So if you have steps in your scene or maybe you have ridges or ledges, uh, you need to adjust this for your scene. Before you press bake, you'll need to save your scene. If you haven't saved your scene, Unity will ask you to do so when you press bake. So I'm gonna press bake, and this doesn't take all that long in a fairly small scene. And what you can see here is the blue is the nav mesh. So these are areas that the nav agent will be able to move around in. Now again, you can see here that the nav agents are gonna be able to go up those walls. So I don't want that. I'm gonna turn down my max slope, something in the 30s, and bake again. And now you can see I've created a gap between the top of the wall and the bottom of the wall. I don't want my player or the AI to be able to walk through the pond. I don't want them to think that the bottom of the pond is a area that they can go to. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on the tiles, select all of my tiles for my water. I'm gonna go to object, and I'm gonna choose them to be navigation static as well. What that brings up is it allows you to select the area, or the navigation area that that object exists in. Right now, by default, it's set as walkable, where the player and the AI can go. I'm gonna choose non-walkable, and then go back to bake, and press bake. And you can see that the bottom of the pond is no longer part of the nav mesh, and the nav mesh ends at the edge of the pond. It's also worth noting that the nav mesh will only show up and only be visualized if you have the navigation tab active and in the front. If I click to my inspector, it disappears. If I need to go back to my nav mesh and see it again, I have to click on that tab and have it on the top. So I'm gonna get rid of it for now. I don't need to look at it. I'm gonna go back to my inspector. So the next thing I'm gonna do is add in my player object. Now I've taken all my assets that I've downloaded from the asset store and put them into a folder here called downloads. If I open that up and come down here to Toonie Tiny People and then prefabs, I'm gonna drag and drop in the first tiny Toonie person. And I'm gonna rename this object player just so I can keep track of it. Next thing we're gonna do is add a nav mesh agent. 
So the nav mesh agent is kind of the brain. It's what's telling the object how to move around the scene on this nav mesh. So we want to add a nav agent. You can see you got a bunch of different options here. Some of our most important ones here are under steering, our speed, angular speed, acceleration, and stopping distance. We want this player to feel reasonably good and quick. So I'm gonna up the speed quite a bit to 12. I'm gonna up my angular speed to about 500. And I'm gonna make my acceleration considerably higher, about 20. Before we jump into Bolt, I'm gonna add in a flow machine. So we get something to attach our script to. And I'm gonna go to macros and I've created a folder top down and I'm just gonna do this to keep my flow macros organized from my other tutorials. So I'm gonna right click, create Bolt flow macro. Before I forget, I'm gonna attach that to my flow machine like so. I'm gonna double click on the flow graph so that I can start to edit. Now I want this to be a very responsive script. So we need to be doing this every frame, which means we need an update event. Then what we need to be checking is, has the player, the human player, pressed the mouse button down? We're gonna use our left mouse button to move around the scene. So I'm gonna add a unit, input mouse. And we got a couple options here. We got input get mouse button, we got input get mouse button up, and input get mouse button down. So input get mouse button down returns a Boolean and it returns true on the frame the mouse button is pressed. Likewise, the input get mouse button up returns a Boolean that is true on the frame that the mouse button is released. Now those can be useful, but I think for this case, I'm gonna use input get mouse button so that the player can hold the mouse button down and the player object will simply follow the mouse cursor around the scene. I'm gonna connect that flow. And then here we have an option for the mouse button. So button zero is the left button, button one is the right button, and button two is the middle mouse button if you have one on your mouse. So what we need to do is then take this Boolean, put it into a branch, we need to connect our flow. So then if this is true, if the mouse button is down, then we need to do something. We need to do a couple things. The first thing is we need to send a ray, you could kind of think of it as a laser beam, coming out of the camera, going to the point on the screen where the mouse cursor is, and then we need to use that ray and cast it into this scene and see where it hits on the game world. And that way we can get a position to send our player to. And thankfully, Unity does a lot of this work for us. And we can do it in two different chunks. The first chunk is we need to create that ray. And we're gonna create that ray from our camera to the mouse cursor. So the first thing we're gonna look up is camera screen point to ray. I'm gonna choose the second option down here. And this block has got two inputs. First one is the camera. Which camera are we looking through to do this? And Second, what position are we sending this ray through? In this case, the position that we are sending the ray through is the position of the mouse cursor. Deal with the first option here, the camera. I'm gonna drop that. And if I search for camera main, we have this camera main get unit. And what this is gonna do is go out into the scene and get the camera that's tagged main camera. So it is important that your camera is tagged appropriately. So if I click here on my camera, you can see by default, it has been tagged main camera. When you start a new scene, the camera that's in the scene will be tagged main camera. If you've added another camera and you want that to be your main camera, you're gonna need to adjust the tags. So let's come back in here and now we need to get the position of the cursor. And again, thankfully Unity has done that for us. So we drag and drop that down here. I can search for input, mouse position, and we can get the mouse position. So this is going to return the mouse position in screen pixels or pixel coordinates. This block is then gonna turn that into a ray. And then we need to send that ray to our physics engine, which is gonna actually cast the ray in our world and detect what it hits. We're gonna drag the flow out from the screen point to ray, and we're gonna search for physics ray cast. And you're gonna get a whole lot of options here. And the one I'm interested in is down here with the input of ray, we also have hit info, max distance, and layer mask. So I'm gonna choose that, and I'm gonna connect the ray across so the raycast knows where to go. This max distance, in our case, I don't really care how far it goes. Our camera's not gonna be that far away. So I'm gonna select 150, 150 units, 150 meters. Now my layer mask, this controls what objects, which layer are we detecting a collision with, so to speak. This raycast, what it's doing is sending a ray out and seeing what it hits and returning some info in that. And that's gonna get returned in this hit info output. So the layer mask, I'm gonna drag this down. I'm gonna search for layer mask, and I'm gonna do layer mask literal. And here we can control what layers go into our ray. Before we select that, I'm gonna go back into our scene. And if I look at my terrain object, I've already got mine set on the terrain layer. Now you may not have a terrain layer in your scene. If you need to add that, come down to add layer and you can add any layers that you want. You can see that I've already got a terrain layer, an enemy layer and a water layer. These will be used in later tutorials for building up other functionality. So I'm gonna come back to my terrain 
Again, if you just created that layer, you need to assign that layer to the terrain. And when you do that, it's gonna bring up this window here. And it's gonna give you the option to apply that layer to all of the children. Now, in my case, I don't want the stones and the props, the buildings, the trees. I don't want that to be part of my terrain layer because I don't wanna be clicking on top of a building, on top of a rock and trying to have the player go there. So I'm gonna choose the option here in the middle, know this object only. I'm gonna go back to my flow graph and here in the layer mask, I'm gonna select just the terrain. Now we need to tell the player where to go, but we only wanna tell the player to go somewhere if we got a valid result out of our Raycast, if this was actually able to hit something on the train. If the player clicked on something that was not part of the terrain or clicked off of the train, we don't want the player to go there. So we need to drag out this Boolean into a branch and then connect our flow. So if that's true, if the Raycast hit something, then we wanna move the nav agent to that position. So I'm gonna drag out the true and I'm gonna search nav agent set Set destination. Now this flow graph is gonna be placed on our player object. So this first option here of which nav agent we wanna select can just be left empty so that it goes to the self. And then the target, we need to tell it where to go. And that information is contained here in the hit info output. So I'm gonna drag this out. I can search for raycast hit point. So what I wanna do is get the raycast hit point. I'm gonna drag the output of that unit up into my target and that'll tell the player where to go. So if I take a step back, this flow graph, this is gonna do all the work of moving our player around the scene in a smart, intelligent way, avoiding obstacles. So let's go test it and see how it works. Before we can test this, we need our player to be on the screen. So you need to make sure that your camera is in a position that you can see the player. When you select the camera, you can get a preview and I can see my player right there in the middle of my camera scene. So I'm gonna push play and test this out. Now, if I click on the scene, you can see that my player is moving to where I clicked. If I click here on the rock, it's gonna to try to go to some point near where I clicked, or it's going behind the rock, because that raycast went through the rock and hit the train behind it. If I click over here, the object's gonna come around. So there you go, we've got a player object using a nav mesh moving around our scene to the point on the scene where we clicked. In the next tutorial, we'll look at setting up the camera so that our camera can follow our player around the scene.